everyone. Welcome to Momentum Boost. I am your host, Adrian Gold Davis, and I'm really happy to have you with me this evening. This is our very first boost of 2022. So starting tonight and continuing throughout the month of February, we are going to focus on the theme of peace and wholeness in the home. And we have fabulous lineup of amazing, insightful guests who are going to share their wisdom and advice on various topics related to developing and sustaining a nurtured and nurturing family, whether that's caring for ourselves or caring for others like our spouses or our children. And tonight we're going to talk about parenting specifically, the importance of being a humble parent. Now, for all of you watching tonight, I think you can definitely agree that there is nothing more humbling than becoming a parent. Of course, when we become a parent, we need to learn and master a vast number of tangible skills that we weren't used to, like changing a diaper and learning how to swaddle a newborn or how to warm a bottle. But becoming a parent forces us to learn incredibly powerful intangible skills that allow us to grow as a person, like embracing humility. Now, humility is not this downcast, slope-shouldered, I'm a nothing thing. It's not thinking less of yourself. Rather, it's more about thinking of yourself less. And it's a trait that is often forced upon us by our children. And that's a good thing, especially our teens. It's better to acquire it ourselves first, I think, than have it forced upon us. Humility helps us recognize that we're all learners and that we must stay open to new information and new modes of behavior and even our own behavior. You know, it's been said that humility is the greatest charisma of them all because it leaves space for others. It creates space for wisdom to enter. And in Jewish tradition, Essential work on our character traits is part of the great Jewish tradition of Musar. Musar is a Jewish spiritual practice that gives solid instructions, tangible instructions on how to live a meaningful and ethical life. It's often called values-based ethics. And Rabbi Lopian once described Musar as the teaching to the heart what the mind already understands. And the great Musar rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, he attempted to create a mass movement in the Jewish world to enable individuals to choose their behaviors and responses from the better parts of their humanity. So tonight we are very privileged and honored to have two extraordinary special guests with us. And they're gonna share their expertise and wisdom on this topic. This is Mrs. Rochi Koval and Dr. Alan Marinas. Now, Ruchi Koval is the co-founder and associate director of congregation JFX. It's an innovative, incredible community in Cleveland, Ohio. And she's been a Jewish educator for over two decades. She leads self-development groups for adults and even for teens. And she mentors educators from around the world. And she's a certified parenting coach. And she's a motivational speaker. And she's a musician. And she's an author. She's a knuckles machine. And she's a mother. And she is also a trip leader and an educator for Momentum. And she inspires hundreds and hundreds of women on their journeys in Israel. And she's also a columnist for the Cleveland Jewish News. And her very first book, Conversations with God, was released in 2016. And her second book, Soul Construction, is also spectacular. Dr. Ellen Moranis is the founder of the Musar Institute and a leading figure in contemporary revival of the Musar movement. It's an 1,100-year-old, authentic, Jewish, personal, and communal spiritual tradition that was nearly lost following the Holocaust. A filmmaker, a Rhodes Scholar, and an anthropologist, he reached a personal turning point in his life in 1997 that led to his exploration personally of Musar. And following years of study with Rabbi Yechiel Per, an accomplished master who stood in an un broken line of transmission of the Musar tradition. Alan reinterpreted this ancient Musar traditions and practices and learnings for modern audiences in his books, Climbing Jacob's Ladder and Everyday Holiness. In 2004, he founded the Musar Institute to address the growing public interest in Musar. And he went on then to author two more books, Everyday, Holy Day, and With Heart in Mind. 
please join me in welcoming Ruchi and Alan. Whoa. You know, I made a stupid little attempt to explain Musser in my introduction, but you know, I probably should have left that to you. So let's do me a favor and let's define terms. I'm going to ask both of you, maybe doctor, you can go first. What is Musser and how is it related to peace in the home? I, I thought you did a pretty good job, Adrian, and I Thanks. don't think you should be so humble. <laughs> you took it don't worry, far. I'm taking it. <laughs> no, the thing is that Musser is about self-development, but I often say that it is development of the self, but not for the sake of the self. And as you said, it's a spiritual development tradition. And very often we see the idea of working on yourself or improving yourself or developing yourself. It's for worldly goals. It's for tangible things. But being situated in the Jewish world and as a spiritual practice, it's higher than that. Musser is really about fulfilling the potential of the soul, becoming the kind of holy being you have the potential to be, and that many of us feel like we really would like to be, and that the Torah says we should be, because it mm -hmm. says, Kiddoshim Tihiyu, you shall be holy. So what we have here is a way of working on yourself, but not for the sake of yourself, not for selfish reasons, huh. but in order to fulfill the potential of a human being that is baked into each of us. Oof, that was exquisite. Ruchi, you weigh in, please. Actually, the Muslim masters teach us that one should not speak before one who is greater than them in age or wisdom. So I won't speak to age, but in terms of wisdom, I'm glad you called on, uh, on Alan first. Uh, the, um, the age the, piece is in, indisputable, Ruchi. <laughs> you know, we can talk about that if you'd like. But in any event, um, you know, I think actually both of you did a masterful job. But um, what was interesting about Rabbi Yisrael Salanter's approach in terms of starting, you know, Musar has been around since the beginning of wisdom. Um, but what Alan, Moore, what uh, Rabbi Salanter attempted to do was to create a movement to turn character development into a primary avenue for spirituality. And, and there were many approaches at the time for what might be a primary avenue to spirituality. Was it academic Torah study as the Lithuanian you know, academic track? Or would it be passion and love and joy as the Hasidic movement took it? And the Muslim movement took it in the sense of shaping one's character. And um, I, I love what you said, Alan, about not for the sake of oneself, because I would say that's the difference between manners and Musar. Because huh. both of them focus on behaving yourself, but manners is about how you behave when other people are watching. Like somebody is sitting in front of me, so don't eat, you know, like a slob, use your fork and knife, you know, but if nobody's around and it's two o'clock in the morning and I, I want to find a ice cream in my freezer, well, I'll eat it however I want. Because manners is about how does it affect other people. Mm. Muster is primarily about how it affects you. If I you know, gobble up the ice cream at two o'clock in the morning, well, what, then I am not behaving as the spiritual godly being that I am. And so it's about shaping you for the sake of you. Of course, the spillover is going to be enormous toward others, right? But that's not the main thing. The main thing is about shaping your soul or the way I like to talk about it in my classes. It's about polishing your inner diamond. Mm, that's beautiful. You know, it strikes me the world has been obsessed with Kabbalah for the last, what, 30 years. I wish they had been obsessed with Musar. I think we've gotten a lot further as a society if that had been the, you know, maybe we need a different colored string for that one for our wrists. So since we're going to dovetail this into parenting and the power of being a humble parent or the necessity forced upon you or chosen, let's do a quick definition of humility through this lens as well. Ruchi, this time, would you mind going first? Yeah, sure. So you know, the interesting thing about humility is, as you said, uh, Adrian, it's not about I'm a nothing. Humility is actually about being very cognizant about what you are and what you aren't, about what your responsibilities are to this world. And most importantly, where did those attributes come from? So the best example of humility in the Torah is Moses, because the Torah says that he was both the greatest prophet that ever lived and the most humble person that ever lived. And he himself transcribed those words. So he wrote about himself that he was the greatest prophet who ever lived. Yet he also wrote, I, I, I Moses, I'm the greatest, most humble person who ever lived. Why? 
because he was acutely aware of his potential, acutely aware of his indebtedness to the universe thereby, and most importantly, acutely aware that it was God who had gifted him with this enormous potential. And therefore, it gives one not a sense of arrogance, but quite the opposite, an extreme sense of gratitude and humbleness that mm. spurs one on to greater achievement. Fake mm. humility, which is I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody, that spurs you on to nothing. That's discouragement. That keeps you stuck. And that is not humbleness. Oh. Okay, now, Alan, what say you on this? And it's interesting, based on what Ruchi is saying, there's a lot of false humility and a lot of fake vulnerability these days that can be used as tools to present an image of yourself to the world. How do you differentiate between the two? Well, if I can tie that together with the way I summarize what humility is, I Please. actually draw on something from the Talmud, which talks about a kind of intriguing idea, which that a person who sits in the same place in the synagogue every day, that person will be called a humble person. And what we can learn from that is that it's not not sitting, not taking a seat. That's not what humility is. Humility is occupying your rightful space. Cool. And I think that that creates the foundation for addressing what you raised, Adrian, because when you're looking at how people speak, how they occupy any kind of space, psychological space, emotional space, uh, financial space, political space, the question is what is right for them hmm. in relation to their own soul mm -hmm. and in relation to other people. So the thing about a person who sits in the same place in the synagogue every time, that person occupies their space and leaves the other space for other people. Uh -huh. And and that really is where we see the right kind of humility, because as you were saying, and as Rookie said, it's not shrinking to nothingness. That's not humility. That's a kind of arrogance, because all you're thinking about, you said in your introduction, think about yourself less. But a person who says, I'm nothing, I'm not, they're all, they're thinking about themselves the whole time. It's That's the opposite. Right. Right. And so to gauge humility, your own and other people, you really look at the feeling it gives you, the feeling of whether it's in the right place, they're in the right place, you're in the right place. Are you feeling squished? You know, I'm sure we've all been to parties where there's somebody there who makes you feel like they suck the air out of the room. You know, they're so dominant inappropriately. Like some people in some contexts, like Moshe, meant to be dominant in that context that's occupying your rightful space. It's not being uh, a nebbish and nothing. And similarly, sometimes people have to step up to humility. Oh. Because it's not about, it's about occupying your rightful space. And sometimes what you're supposed to do is speak up or disagree or claim or whatever is rightful in that situation, then that's true humility. Wow. So what I'm hearing from both of you is that humility is is a relationship, not just with yourself, but with how you come across and how you allow space for others. So to bring it back to this whole notion of shalom bayit or peace in the home, I would imagine that humility is not just an important factor in parenting, which is, of course, forced upon us, but also in marriage. So what I would like to ask, Rohi, is do you think that parents, what behaviors are at odds with humility in a parent who feels like they're losing control. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the biggest mistakes that parents make is that their children exist as an image extension of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is that as soon as your kids get a little older, they will quickly disabuse you of that notion. However, some parents don't give up and, and they don't let go. The truth is, according to Jewish spirituality, our children are not ours. They're given to us as a sacred trust from God. And one day, God willing, they will separate themselves from us and they will go on to create their own lives. And so us hanging on to them, whether it's, no, you can't wear that, or no, you can't do that, or, or you're embarrassing me, um, is, is a false sense of arrogance. Like as Alan put it, we're taking up too much space and, and not rightful space. 
Mm. You know, one of, one of the teachings that you reminded me of, Ellen, as you were speaking, is uh, the, the muster teachers teach us, in a place where there is no leader, step up and be a leader. Well, that just speaks to the situationality of that teaching. Meaning, if there is a leader, by all means, shrink back and allow others to lead. If there is no leader, step forward. And even if you don't want to, even if you're shy or reserved or reticent, you know, you have to push yourself. Some, to, some people have to push themselves to contract. Some people have to push themselves to expand. And so I think with our kids, it's like, and to me, this speaks to the whole push and pull of parenting. In my opinion, every parenting dilemma ever will fall under this exact teaching, when to expand and when to contract when to lead and when to follow. And so the arrogance of parenting is when we lead too much and don't step back and let our kids be who they need to be. Whoa. Now, in the pursuit of a peaceful home of Shlom Bayit with your children, clearly there has to be some kind of guide post about when you stand up and when you shrink back. So Alan, from your perspective, what does it mean to be a humble parent and to know when you step forward and when you step back? And how can working on that trait of humility in ourselves translate into behavioral changes? Right. Um, There's many, many sides to that question and this issue. But I think if we bring it down to something practical and specific, it's that It's about motivation. It's when the motivation is ego based. I want to control that child because I'm in charge. Then we're or whatever it might be, but it's ego based. Then that's something to watch out for because there's a lack of humility there. Where humility comes in is in the sense of it's objectively right. It's a correct value. It's not because it's my will. Uh that I'm imposing it on you. It's that there is a real basis here for saying, this is the right thing to do in this situation. And I'll explain to you why it's the right thing in relation to you and our family and me and the larger community, et cetera. So when it's a battle of wills, that brings it back to the ego. And that's where humble parenting is much more effective because you kind of get yourself out of the way a little bit. And that sidesteps the conflict. And that's not just with children, as you're saying, that's also in relationship as well. One of the big questions and one of the great things about situation, situating all this parenting and relationships in a spiritual context is that when you raise the question, who's in charge? You know, it's not you and not me. Like we are not the rulers of the universe bringing that into the context of relationship is actually a very helpful thing for creating healthy relationships because you're just not the king or the queen or the prime minister or the president and each of us is just a player in a much larger drama recognizing that bring that into the picture lowers the emotional charge and says what's right what is the objective value we're pursuing here And that's something that people can then discuss, understand, and get behind. Whereas if it's ego-based, it's just going to end up with a butting of heads. Mm -hmm. Although I would assert, and and Rochi, perhaps you could comment on this, that sometimes as parents, when we feel we do know what is the right thing, and it's not coming from a place of ego, we still can't get our kids on board with that. And then we get that lovely trait of righteous indignation, right? (laughs) Which, you know, is really just control wearing a costume, truly. So what kind of things would a person who has done the Musar work on humility, what kind of a humble parent, what things would one say to oneself when you have attempted to do just as Alan laid up and still there is no compliance and you're worried and afraid and you're not sure what to do? That's a great question. Um, I I would suggest that one be very careful to look out for parenting from fear because fear takes God out of the picture. And I'm going to bring the conversation back to God. If I did mine, I did my share. I really did the introspection. Is this the right time to step up, to share, to say something? Did I do it mindfully, respectfully, privately, humbly, and it still didn't work? 
that's God's will. And I would also bring in another really big picture idea, which is that if we talk about Musar as the practice of emulating God, of emulating God's character traits, right? So this is a very mystical idea, but God himself, so to speak, expands and contracts throughout the story of his management of the universe. So God expanded to create this universe and then God contracted to give us free will. And one can only imagine God's mindset, so to speak, as he watches us making epic mistakes, you know, and it's almost like God is thinking, what on earth are you thinking? I literally just told you not to do that. So, but God doesn't say that. He gives us space. He gives us time. He's slow to anger. He's patient. And so when I feel that my parenting is ineffective, so to speak, I can look at God because one can only imagine that God also, and this is expressed in the books of the prophets, God also sometimes feels like his kids are really messing up and God still loves us and he's still there for us and he will never abandon us. And that's what we need to try to imitate if we want to be as godly as possible ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, but it strikes me, you know, there's going to be people listening who are uncertain about their definition of God. It may not be as evolved as yours or yours, Ellen, where there is a deep spiritual connection and a lack of fear of the word or the concept of a higher power, if you will. So Alan, you have said in the past that um, humility is related to truth. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking about now is if a person struggles with the concept of God, can you see God as truth? Is there a relationship there? And what is truth? In, in Hebrew, the word for truth is emet, and that's one of the names of God. And in another place, it says truth is the seal of God. There's a great deal of relationship there. And because anybody who presents an image of God is blaspheming because we don't know. We can't say nobody right. knows. This is beyond the ability of human beings to have any kind of conception. I tend to want to talk about it in the negative in a certain sense of I know I can't say very much about God, but I know I'm not in charge of the universe. Uh -huh. I know that with certainty. I know that anytime I feel like my will is the dominant thing that has to be imposed on everybody and everybody has to do it my way. I know I've gone over a line because that's just not true. Truth is being abandoned at that point because I'm not in charge. And the truth is whenever we do do that, we just end up feeling frustrated. It never ends well. Well, it doesn't work. It's not, it's not practical. It's not truthful. It's not, they, you know, they say, and there's a saying, Sheker uh, Ainlo Raglayam, that falseness has no legs. Uh -huh. It has nothing to stand on. Truth stands much more solidly. There's things about that. So, but I think that the, so that I see it in the negative. In other words, don't, I don't find it being a theological question necessarily of God being in charge. I think the humility piece is knowing that I'm not. And that, and that as a result of that, when I'm dealing with another human being who may be four years old, I know that I am not the emperor of that kid. On the other hand, I am the parent. And I see it all the time, including in my own family, of people who think that their, their child is their partner and they have to have equal say in decisions that get made, which really is, again, untruthful because the ability of a child, their experience, their knowledge, their ability to assess a situation, risks. and a, a parent has that responsibility Wow. As a matter of correctness and truth, not because of ego and power, mm -hmm. but because of the basis in truth of what's in the kid's best interests and what's in your best interests. I think also from a practical perspective, Adrian, that the kids can sniff out in a heartbeat if your parenting is coming from arrogance or from maturity, and that will also have a deep impact on your results. Yeah. And what if you don't know? What if you are working on humility and on, on an intellectual level, you know that, I mean, maybe that's step one to, to accepting the concept that there's something above you is to say, I don't know about God, but I know I'm not God. Maybe that's like the entryway, step one in. But what if you're attempting to reach this level of humility where you know that you don't run the world? 
but you can't stop hearing those voices in your head that are telling you, but you should try one more time. Try one more time. How do you determine when to, mm -hmm. as you said, Rohi, say, okay, I did my best and God's decided the answer is no now? Well, I'll take a stab first, because one of the things about, it's a very difficult question. It ties into a much larger area about hishtadlut, which is the effort a human being is required to make, and bitachon, which means trust. Right. When do you make effort and when do you trust? And you get it exactly right in the rear view mirror. <laughs> you don't know at the time and you're making your best guess and your best assessment. And humility means you accept that you're doing the best you can and you may well make mistakes and you'll learn from those mistakes. Don't hold yourself to a standard of perfection. That is also arrogant. Who are you? You're a human being and you're going to try. And so you have to try and as best you can to learn, learn from your experience, learn from other people, learn from wisdom teachings, learn from people who have been there before you, because none of us is walking a path that hasn't been walked before, not. We're walking our own individual version of it. And then at a certain point, when you see that the wheels are spinning, it's time to take your foot off the accelerator because you're not getting any traction with this. And either try something different or recognize that this situation is again beyond your control that really that's a reality of being a human being okay so my next question here is that you know there's this concept that you fake it till you make it mm -hmm. but it doesn't really work till you mean it like till it's real in you mm -hmm. so if you are working on your humility if this is the practice the the meta the character trait that you're trying to work on what kind of things does a humble parent say, for example, Rahi, does a humble parent apologize to their child? Do they apologize for the stuff they did wrong in the past? What does it look like in practice? What will the kid notice? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and I think part of the whole practice of Musser is becoming much, much more self-aware. So when you say it doesn't really work until you mean it, I don't really know if that's true because Musser is often about uh, behaving as though on the outside and and the Torah thought is that it will begin to impact who you are on the inside and and I think one of the things that really starts to happen first is just self-awareness like perhaps even before your behaviors have changed so for example if I am parenting out of fear or anger or being reactive I'll start to notice that I am experiencing the physical symptoms of anger my heart is beating fast my brow is furrowed I'm sweating and, and that's, that's a signal to me to say, okay, stop. This is not coming from my higher self. This is coming from my lower self, right? And mm -hmm. so step one is one thing that a humble parent does is begin to notice their own inner emotional reality. Because it's like, if someone says to you, whoa, you're angry, like, I'm not angry, okay? <laughs> but instead perhaps saying, gosh, I am angry. I probably shouldn't have this conversation right now. Uh -huh. Um, as far as apologizing, I, you know, one thing about apologizing that's very interesting, and I've noticed this, you know, our, our kids, thank God we have seven kids and they range in age from 27 down to 11. So we have various stages going on. And one thing I've noticed about raising adult kids is that the temptation exists to apologize for past mistakes. Because as you said, Ellen, there's that rear view mirror and there's that hindsight. Um, and one thing I've become aware of is that very often that apology is for me. I want to discharge my guilt and regret. Uh, but will it be good for that child to reopen old wounds and old chapters? Not necessarily. Uh, so to me, it's not necessarily about whether you apologize. I think apologies have their place in every relationship, but rather there's that self-awareness. Why am I apologizing? Is this for me or is this for them? And that's the difference between arrogance and humility. Uh, wow. So I'm going to ask you both as we wrap up this evening to just Give me your closing statement for the value of the work of Musar, of character building, of refinement, as it relates to the way you will raise your children and ultimately raise yourself. Give me your pitch, if you will, for people really throwing themselves into that work. Alan, you could start. Okay. Um you know, touching on what I said earlier about truth 
and also about doing things because they're right, not because it's your own personal will and tying that into humility. I want to leave with a very practical suggestion, which is that in a family situation, it's very helpful to have a discussion and maybe even write out some shared value goals for the family. Mm. Because in the moment, what might be an argument or might be a disagreement or battle of wills, if it has a reference point of, we're a family that believes in truth, we're a family that believes in kindness, we're a family that believes in generosity, whatever the issue may be, if there is a discussion and a kind of establishment of a value base, it's funny because this is what goes on in organizations and businesses all the time, sure. value statements and mission statements, but it works at the family level too. Those shared values become a reference point outside the ego. And that gives you the test of whether is this for me or is this for you or is this because we believe in this, these are our higher values that we're ascribing to. Wow. That I think can be an intercession into the kinds of dynamics that go on in a family that break it out of the ego place. And that allows for humility and a, and a way of talking about what we're trying to accomplish here that is not just me versus you, which is where it all breaks down, but us working towards that. And then we're sharing and on the same side, working towards a common goal. Oh, that's exquisite. And Ruch, what say you? That's beautiful, Alan, thank you. Uh, two closing thoughts I would give is that first of all, as parents, we are also responsible to be role models in humility and in how we communicate. So be careful not to jump to conclusions when other people seemingly did you know, the unthinkable, like from the smallest thing, like who forgot to take out the trash to the biggest thing, who just put this much money on my credit card. Um, and so to open conversations with humble expressions, like I'm not sure what happened, but I noticed that blah, 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 or it could be, I don't have all the facts, but here's how it seems to me. So you're couching your conversations that must be had because you are the parent, um, in humble, respectful terms. And that will invite back more humbleness and respect from others. And, and moreover, you're doing your job, which is teaching by example what humble communication looks like. The second thing I'd like to suggest is that there are certain things we just don't talk about. Politics is one of them. We have very vehement, strong political views in our family. Um, and we've noticed that when we start to talk about these things, it's very, very hard to stay humble. It's a humble trigger. And so we don't need to talk about those things. We have a lot of other wonderful, interesting things. And I'm not saying that we always have to agree. Robust discussion and disagreement is the part of being in a relationship. But if you see that certain topics are constantly making it impossible for you, I, sh I shouldn't say impossible, but really hard for you to maintain that humbleness, then maybe that's just not something that needs to be talked about all the time, if at all. So, so wise. You know, I could talk to you guys for the next two hours and I wouldn't run out of questions for you. And I just wanna thank you both, Alan and Rochi, so much for joining us here today. I find this conversation so insightful and I think you've left all of us with so much to explore and to think about and to get working on. And I know you've been with us before and I certainly hope that you'll be with us again in the future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Ruchi. A pleasure as always. Oh, thank wow. You. Same here. Oh. And to the rest of you in Momentum Land, please be sure to join us again next week on Monday, the 7th of February at 8 p.m. Eastern time for our next Momentum Boost. I'm going to be joined with a licensed psychologist. Her name is Dr. Amber Valentine Minion. And we're going to continue this conversation on parenting, but this time through the lens of nurturing ourselves, especially in times of stress, in order to properly nurture our children. So for myself, Adrian Gold Davis, and all of us here at Momentum, please remember that as we learn and grow and parent together, that the highest form of wisdom will always be kindness. Good night, everybody. I've got a thousand questions coming from deep within. Want to cut through the clutter? I need to know that my next move matters.